I'm Alan Yates and I'm here to take you for a spot of shore fishing. Just been in Doug the Bay, got some ragworm and some peeler crabs. The ragworm, I've got them in water, let's get a handful out. They are nice and fresh. I'll put them in the water to purge themselves and I'll add them to some weed, just dry copper weed. When I get back to the car, we'll put them in a, a tray with some newspaper and uh, let them dry out. The newspaper is so-called water up. Then they'll go nice and tough and red. The crabs, we've got a few hens and a few cock crabs. There's a nice cock crab. See, you pull the leg off the tallies of peeler and there's a little leg underneath. The hens, they're just ideal for the eels. The cock are half of him for the flounders. We've got enough bait there for the day, so we'll go and do some fishing. Here we are on the Bund Wall. I've been told by the locals that this is the top spot in Langston Harbour for daylight fishing, for eels, flounders, perhaps an odd bass or a place. Um, over here you can see the town of Portsmouth the docks, the cranes in the far distance there. And to the rear of us, we'll be fishing into this side. The rear, we've got the oyster beds. Now, they used to breed oysters here, and there's a great clutch of oyster beds right through this area. Um, this wall, the bun wall we're on, is rather dilapidated and broken down now, but it, um, it gives us a nice platform to get well out into the harbour to fish. Now, the setup I'm going to use today, as you can see, I've got a, a butt caster. That's the reel at the bottom. Um, I've got a Ziplex 2500, it's an 8 foot 6 tip and a 5 foot butt. The reel, it's an Abu 65 uh, Ultra Cast and it's got a, a CT frame, that's a conversion frame on it. Um, the basic reel that we use, out straight out of the box, comes with a level line there. That moves back and forwards and you can see it restricts the reel line. We've also got a top bar on the top of the reel. Now that means when we're casting, we can't get our thumb right over the, the bar. The tendency is to lock your bar, thumb under the bar. And it's quite painful if it happens. With the, the frame conversion, you can see we can get the thumb right over and really grip the spool, which means greater distance cast because you can simply put more pressure on the spool. The frame itself, you can get complete for the 6.5. Now a lot of the other makes and multipliers you can get conversion kits would involve cutting the top bar out. Now that's done with a hacksaw. Now it's not the sort of thing you want to do to your best favourite multiplier you just paid £100 for unless you're sure you know what you're doing. So one way to do it is to take it to a dealer and get a professional to do it or buy an ABU and use the frame. Now, there are, other, there are other frames that we use, and later on I'll show you one of my favourite frames apart from this one. Now, line, I've got 15 pound main line, and I've got a, a leader, 60 pound leader. This one I've got here is a new one from Diawa, it's a tapered leader, which means that I haven't got a bulky leader knot to join to the main line. I've got 60 pound at the beginning, it tapers down, right down the bottom to 15 pound, and that gives me a nice neat knot. When you're casting, if you do happen to catch your thumb on the knot, a big bulky leader knot can rip your thumb apart. So those small knots are ideal. What you do do when you're fishing, you make sure the leader knot is away from the side of the reel that you're thumbing. So in my case, I thumb that side, so I really lean and put the leader knot there. Anyway, we'll rig up, get the line through the rings. I've got a, a QF swivel on here, I'll explain it later but it, it helps to thread the line through the rings. If you've just got an end of line, quite often you drop it. With this, you can get your thumb right holding. And today, well, we've got a full sight gale straight in our face. And um, we're gonna have some fun, I think. Anyway, we'll thread the rings up. Tip of this rod, you can see I've got some fluorescent tape. Nice and handy to see at night, reflective tape. You can use 
white paint emulsion, anything like that. All right, that's just a little, little, little bit more line out. And we're going to rig out the box. Rigs, most the anglers nowadays have cotton on that uh, it's a good idea to store their rigs in a rig wallet. Instead of, old, in the old days, you used to have your hook stuck in cork and wrapped around bits of cardboard. Nowadays, it's a proper sealable wallet, keeps the salt out, and it keeps each, each rig individually. As you can see, you can carry dozens and dozens of rigs. What I do, I've got a, a Peter Merritt rig here. I've also got this one, this firm's out of action now, but uh, Ian Golds from Portsmouth, they do some nice rig wallets. And you can get all manner of sizes, and you can get all manner of inserts inside them. Anyway, an addition, if you're like me, you've got thousands of rigs everywhere, is a few sealable plastic bags. They're ideal. Anyway, the rig we're going to use today, we've got two choices. We've got um, quite a strong wind, so we want a heavy lead, but not only that, we've got to choose whether we want one hook, two hooks, or three. Now, obviously, three hooks won't cast as far as, as one. We can also use bait clips. Now, the bait clip, there's a rig here with two hooks on it with bait clips. Now, they'll enable us to pin the, the baited hook close to the line and it'll give us a few more yards when we cast. Lead, as I said, I'm going to use a six ounce. Now, in this case, I've got a, one of the new six ounce breakaway leads. Now, that's the new model, not being long out from Nigel Price for breakaway tackle. I don't use long tail leads very often. They're not really an advantage. Um, they perhaps make the lead flight better when you're casting long distances, but that's about all. There are other types. That's the bought one from Breakaway. That's a Breakaway lead I make myself. The difference being that this lead, the grip on the wires can be adjusted much tighter. And if you're fishing a really strong tide, you don't want the Breakaway to keep clipping out when the line pulls the lead against the tide. So these, these wires I make myself, they're a DCA mould, but they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. That's about five ounces, that one, this is six. Um, the other alternative, of course, is a fixed grip lead. It's not used a lot by sea anglers because it's hard work to pull in. Uh, bumbling along the, the ground, along the shingle, it catches up and it's really hard work on your arm. Um, obviously, in very strong tidal conditions, and we've not got them here today, we would need that. A handy addition to a fixed lead is a lead lift. Let's put that one down. Now, the lead lift works two ways. Here, we've got a, a lot of broken rock and boulders and all sorts of things. And at low tide, that goes down about 40 yards. And if we get a decent fish on, he could very well pull us into that, that shingle. So what we put on is a lead lift. Now, um, this is like a plane. It planes the lead up off the bottom. In fact, they'll come up almost directly where you land. So in other words, if you're casting 90 yards, that'll come up at 90 yards on the surface. Um, if you've got a big fish, it, it won't come up so well, but it'll help to keep the lead away from the rock. It also helps in the case of the fixed lead to plane it above the shingle so that it doesn't catch up. So with the a, with a addition of a lead lift, um, a fixed scrap becomes much more comfortable to use. I don't very really often use plain leads. Um, I find that a grip lead, either a breakaway or a fixed, tends to um, act as a, a bolt rig, we say. When a fish takes the, the bait, it's stopped by the lead. Um, the, there is some advantage in drifting with a plain lead sometimes, but for the majority of fishing, and I do a lot of match fishing, um, I want the, the lead to stay where it is and the fish to meet a force that it can't move. Right, now the, the rig. I'll put a lead lift. I'll put a plain lead on, on this one to start. We've got easy links on the bottom. They're not quite as easy as they're, they're made out because for some reason mustard are making them now with a bent wire. They were originally straight and they're much, they're hard on your thumbnail. You wear your thumbnail out uh, with them. Anyway, an easy link, a Berkeley swivel, you tend to use all Berkeley or mustard swivels, the quality swivels. There's a lot of danger in a break off during casting, so you want good quality swivels, and the same goes to the line. The trace body is a continuation of the leader line. I personally don't like um, traces made from bright orange line, although I, I don't really think there's that much in it. 
as far as putting the fish off. But I use one make of line for my traces and that's Gantel. It's quite popular amongst the match anglers. It's quite a good quality line. Now that's 60 pound. And you must remember to continue the strain of your trace from your leader through your trace. It's no good having a 50 pound leader and then a 30 pound trace because the trace will snap on the casting pressure. We come up from the lead, the lead link, the swivel, and we've got this contraption here. Now this is a bait clip. This one's one of Paul Kerry's bait clips. It's a manufactured one that you can buy, fairly easy to put on. All you do is put it on the line. It's like a hook that goes through a rubber sleeve, slides up and down the line. The way it works, if we can get this uh, tangle undone, is the hooks with the bait on, goes on the clip like that. And when it's tensioned, it hangs like that. Now, the fact that the bait is close to the line and just behind the lead makes the setup set much more streamlined. So distance is improved. I would say about 30% more distance. In a situation like this where we've got a lot of wind, this is quite a useful setup. Um, bait clips though do become a disease amongst sea anglers because they come this is conscious and they use bait clips all the time and, and that's not advisable. There are a lot of times when fishing without a bait clips can, can be a definite advantage. Up further we've got the nitty gritty of the trace. Now what I've got here and there are lots of variations on this theme is I've got the main line going through two beads and you can see the beads and they trap the swivel and then either side of the beads I've got a stop knot. And there is a tendency to make up rigs with a knot in the trace. Now this is very dangerous because it weakens the length of the main line on the trace. So never put a knot in the middle of that trace because 60 pound line quickly becomes 30. From the swivel again um, we've got a, a blood knot, a half blood knot. We come to, in this case, I've got a limerick blued spade end hook from Mustad. Now these are the ultimate eel and flounder hooks. There's not really a better one, although Cox and Rawl have just brought out a new, let me get this out, a new crab hook. And this seems to answer a few problems. This one's an eyed one. Most of you won't want to mess around tying spade ends. I did a bit of fresh water and that's how I learned. It's quite easy really, but it takes practice and time. Now, the cox and rule, as you can see, is a very, very similar hook, but it's got an eye. Mustard did bring out an eyed limerick, but it's a softer wire. Now, when I'm fishing in a position like this for flounders and eels, a bass might come along. Now, I don't want a soft hook because it, it'll bend out on a bass. The limericks are perfect. They're very strong and they handle a bass. Right, moving up the trace, this one's got two hooks and two bait clips. I've got snood length, by the way, um, for small fish like flounders and, and eels, 12 inches to 18 inches is adequate. You could get away with 8 inches. Up the top of the trace, we've got the, the other half of that QF squirrel. Now these, from a match fishing point of view, are most useful because we can um, change traces very quickly. All they do is slot in together and there's a little collar around the top and a rubber sleeve that keeps it in position. Now they won't come undone. I've heard a lot of sea anglers say, oh I've had one come undone, but they, these made by Dexters, they are now improved with this collar. Originally they didn't have the collar and they did come undone occasionally, but these will not come undone. I've fished with them for two years now and never, never lost a trace. And the advantage is of course if you're in a, a match situation, you can quickly take one trace off and get another one and put that on. So you can pre-bait another trace while you're fishing and change traces when, you, when you're reel in. Um, that technique is, is most useful when you're, when you're freelance fishing, as I am here, as you'll see throughout the day. Um, if you've got a hooked fish, for instance, an eel in a tangle, you don't want to sit down and waste time tangling, untangling the eel. You can put the eel to one side you can put another trace on, you can cast out. Now, it also means that you can bait up at your leisure. No rushing around, put bait on while you've got, because you want to get a bait tackle back in the sea, you can take your time and the presentation is therefore perfect. Right, we'll put, a, put this trace on. 
I've got a bit of tangle in this. Right, that's that. Now let's look at the bait. Got a cool box, a couple of ice packs, keep it keep the bait fresh. Today we're using the rag one we dug earlier, if I can get it out of the box. Small worms, nice and wriggly. There's about a hundred in there. That's one bait. And then we use peeler crab. Got a box here. You can see here's one that's in the perfect state of peeling. He's just about to pop out of his shell. The crack appearing. Now they're the ones to use. Hard crabs that don't peel haven't got any of the juices in them, but this one has. We simply kill him first and take all the shell off, discard the legs. I've done one earlier. There's a small one peeled, and there's a large one. Small crabs for the eels, whole. The eels have a tendency to, to pick them up and engulf them once. And for flounders, we use half of the big crab or a whole of the bigger crab. Flounders have got quite a big mouth. Although they look small, they can engulf a large lump of bait. And they seem to like a big scenty bit of peeler crab. Baiting up. Now the short shank limerick hook is ideally suited for baiting up with peeler crab. Now the small crab on hole, we put it through the shoulders of the crab three or four times, like that. Twist it round and put the hook in and out of the leg sockets. Now it's a bit fiddly but a bit of practice you get the hang of it. Once it's done, the bait is on there solid. Now that will stand even a very forceful pendulum cast. If you've got any doubt, you can always add a little bit of elastic cotton. Very fine cotton, not the thick shearing elastic, but the knitting elastic. A couple of wraps around that, don't mummify it. That'll keep it on there. Stop with the shore crabs pecking it off. I personally don't use it very often. Now the ragworm we use on a long shank hook. In this case, I've got a Hamasan Aberdeen size two. Pick out the ragworm. Now for eels, one ragworm will suffice. Medium size, six inches. Thread him on from the head. They've got pinches, but if you're careful, they're not really aggressive. Right, now we've, for, for an eel, that one worm like that is quite adequate. The eel will pick that up. But for flatfish like bounders or place, they like a lot of wriggly tails. So put a couple of worms on. Just hook them on the head so that the tails wriggle. There's a tendency with forceful pendulum casting for the tails to fly off. A good tip is to, just before you cast, dunk that bait in the sea. It stops the tails falling off. I don't really know why, but it does. I can ensure, especially the small white rag, king rag, or harbour rag. Right. Now we just clip the rig up before we cast. A bit fiddly, but uh, just put the clip inside the, the hook inside the clip and pull the line tight. You can see it really hangs tight. Pick that up a bit. It really hangs tight to the line, really streamlined. Same with the crab at the bottom. Now there's one point against using cotton the cotton sometimes gets tangled up in the bait clip. And if that happens, that's where your, your bait will stay. The other thing is that with these bait clips, be a bit fussy with them. Make sure that they, the bait does come unshipped when it hits the water. Otherwise, if it lays on the bottom like that, the fish is going to get a mouthful of line with his food. So really what you want is when the weight hits the water, they'll just release and fall free. Right, now, that's a nice streamlined rig. Right, now to the casting. What we can do, we can do a pendulum cast now. We've got strong wind and it's raining quite hard. Um, so we want a low flat cast at the sea. We're quite high up here over these rocks. If we do a long drop pendulum cast, that's a full bore pendulum cast up in the air, we're going to get our weight and our line back in our face. Now, in a tournament field with the wind behind, you can put your lead up high in the sky and the wind will take it. 
most practical fishing conditions are not like that. We've got uneven ground to stand on, rocks, that sort of thing, and we've got wind in various directions, side or front are difficult winds to cast in. So basically what we've got to do, what I use, I use a, a, an adapted pendulum caster, I call it a stubby pendulum caster if you like. Now, the basic setup is thumb on the reel, wrap around the spool, gives you a good grip. Hand up the rod, firm grip. Don't want your arm, your arm stretched and you don't want it bent. Slightly crooked, shall we say. Now the swing, we've got to drop from the rod tip to the lead weight, about the length down to the tip ring, to the butt ring. Remembering the more force that you put in the cast, the longer drop, the further it'll go. But there is a tendency, if you use a long drop, to go high in the sky. So we'll shorten our drop a little bit to combat that wind and push the weight out flat. Now a pendulum cast, a full bore pendulum cast is a lot more involved than just a 360 degree swing. It's too complicated to spend time here on, but what we can, what I can do is show you my basic little stubby pendulum cast, which I use for practical fishing. All it is is out, back and round. Now I did it nice and gently there to show you. Obviously the more force involved, the further it goes. Now, footwork, a lot of people might tell you you've got to stand exactly like this or you've got to do that. That's not the way to cast. The way to cast is to feel comfortable. My feet stand like that. Now when you swivel round, you don't want to be standing like this so you're all twisted and off balance. So make yourself comfortable. If it's a rocky bottom or an uneven slope, move around, dig your feet in, Get really comfortable before you start. Where you put your feet doesn't really matter as long as you are feeling comfortable. The actual cast has got to be smooth, one action. If you jerk, then that's when your trouble with overruns happen. Now you can dock to your reels up, you can put brake blocks in to slow down, you can adjust the tension on the spool to tighten up. One of the basic improvements you can make to your casting is not to load the reel too much line. Now in a tournament condition, a caster would have 350 yards plus on his reel because he wants to cast 200 odd yards so he's got to have a lot of line bearing in mind that line goes up in a bow so it's, it's actually more line out than the distance cut. Now by only putting about 150 yards on a 6,000 Abu like that you're going to get a cast that goes out straight and true without a fluff because there's not enough line behind the lead to overrun. The lead is simply taking all the line off. Now for, for youngsters, juniors particularly, 100 yards of line, you cast it all out. You won't get birds in this, tighten the spool down slightly. Remember, if you're starting casting, and if you're pendulum casting, you're not going to be able to do 250 yards straight away. So start on the bottom rung of the ladder and work up. 100 yards, then put 120 yards on your reel, then 150, and that way you'll learn. It took me a long time to learn to cast. Um, as for the reel up the butt or the reel down, Practically for fishing nowadays, I find that the reel down the butt is a lot better. Less power, it's a slower cast, a gradual cast, the lead goes in a wider arc, therefore you don't shake the bait off, and there's room for mistakes. If you're in a hurry, then the slow arc will allow you to make mistakes. The short up the butt pendulum cast, which I did for years, the timing's got to be perfect and you can make mistakes. Right, we'll reel that in and I'll show you one more time. This is where the lead lifts come in handy. These Abu 65s are not all that fast retrieve, only about four and a half to one, but already that lead lift's come up on the top and it's skating across the surface. A little bit of weed in the water here. And these leaders that we've got on, these tapered leaders are most useful. We've got a, a leader knot back every time without any weed around it, which is most useful. Right, clean the lead off. I won't bother the clip, clip, oh, I'll clip that up. Here we go. Right, again, feet comfortable. The drop, again, not too far. Butt ring, in this case, six foot, allows you to use a, a reasonable size trace as well. The swing, I'm only going to cast gently, just a lob, in fact. Out of way, back, watch the lead, and round. Some like hell, of course, because you've got a headwind. Again, we've got 
the line on the reel, we just have enough off. You never get a bird's nest doing it this way with that limited amount of line that I spoke earlier. You just can't, it's, it's impossible. No matter what model of reel you've got, most of the modern reels are excellent nowadays. You've got magnetic brakes, fiber brakes, they all work well. If you're getting problems, it's your fault. It's your style or, or the amount of force you're putting in, but it's not the tackle. So don't blame the tackle, get some casting lessons. There's lots of casting instructors about in the country and they don't charge a lot either. Some of them do it for nothing. Right now we'll get to some fishing. I've got uh, two rods out now. I've put out uh, it's identical outfits, but I've put one out along about 100 yards and one about 25 to 30 yards. This state of the tide, we might pick up flounders and eels. They should be coming through about now. The short range rod is probably the one that's going to get the most fish because it's close to the rocks down the bottom here. And that's where they'll be. Oh, they've got a bite now, I think. Yeah, there's something there. Very tentative eels, they pick it up and play with it, small ones do. You've got to let them have a bit of time, it's no good striking them straight away. That's better. Yes. Come in slack. Did I get him? That's the question. Yeah, I think there's something on here. Small fish. Clutch is not going to run, of course. Get something huge. This one's a fair way out. Oh yeah, he's pulling now. Neil, I think. Got to keep it up because of the rocks below. They're real fairly fast. Getting close now. Yeah, it's a neil. It's a small eel. See him on the top now. Oh, he's away. He's off. Ah, well that happens sometimes. Look at that, it's spun up. Oh, the line's damaged or not. Gotta get that rod back in the water. It looks like they're coming through at the moment. Another one. This very often happens with two rods. You get a bite on both rods at once. Definitely. themselves and dropping slack. That's a better fish. Let's see if we can get it in this time. One of the problems is I'm reeling in fairly fast so you're putting a lot of pressure on the hook and that last one the hook link went. Yep, it's not a big fish. This one was a long way out, it took longer to get it in. I've got to be careful of these rocks down here. Up now, I don't want to fall down there. I've got to be careful when I get a fish close to the rock, get them up over. Alright, it's a flatty, this one's... He's been down. Here he comes. Oh, it's not a bad one either. Flander or place? Flander, I think. Here he comes. Yeah, not a bad flander at all. Oh yes, nice one. Nice one. About a pound and a half, a pound and three quarters. You swallow the bait, which is what flounders always do. It's a lovely fish. Nice condition. Underneath. Right, what I'll do, I'll snip the line. So I'm taking the hook out now. Put him in the bucket with some water. Let him revive a bit and we'll put him back because I'm not going to keep him. But he'd make a nice fish to eat. You get some nice fillets like that if you like flounder. In you go, fella. Let's get them two dry rods baked up. This advantage of double patting on. Swap that rig there. The old QF and away we go. There's one out of the way. Let's get him out. Now those that flounder come from a fair long way out, so I think I'll back this one. Get it out of ways a bit. Daddy boy, not too excited, as your snap off. Here we go. That's just 
right. Oh, that rain now is bad. Get a bit of a bow, get the baits on the bottom. That's one. Now bait the other one up. A bit of bait left on there, a bit of ragworm. I want a bit of crab on there, a bit of peeler crab. There we go. I want to get that eel. Nice small crab. Now this one, that wind's a problem, so I'd better cast it a little bit away from the first one. Otherwise I'll get them tangled up. In short, this one. Without the swing, I'm just going to cast this one short, so it's a lot. Nice and smooth. And we're in. There we are. Put, these, put this rod rest a bit lower, the wind's catching the, catching the tips a bit. Sometimes when we're fishing, you can get the rod right low down, fresh water style. It's a good idea out of the wind. Stops the movement of the rod tip. When you're when you're really in a gale, especially for fishing like this, and you're getting lots of little bites, the wind you can't tell the difference when the wind blows. It's a good idea to remember that the wind and the tide get in a rhythm. The rod gets in a rhythm. Any alteration out of the rhythm is usually a bite. That seems set up now. I'm not sure the lines are not crossed. And away we go. Oh, it's coming down stair rods now, really raining hard. Fish don't mind though, they're already in the water. That's a little touch there. Yes. That time we had an eel. That, no, I don't know. Yes. Yes, there's something there, small. Tuck the old rod in the, in the hip and I'll help the reel in. Yes, he's on there. Support the, support the reel with your arm as well, that helps. Yes, there's something there, I don't think it's very big, but it's a small fish of some kind. He went in then rocks, but he's out. We got him, that's an eel. Got a big lump of weed on the line. Yeah, slimy about a pound and a quarter. Not a bad one. Put him in the bucket. They're lovely fish really, a lot of people don't like them because they tangle up your line, the bigger ones are not so bad. Now when you're handling a, an eel, always have a small bit of rag, because if you have a big towel like that to keep your hands dry, it gets covered in slime, it's always, I'll have a slime rag, a flannel usually. These big eels, they're not too, too much trouble to hold. Two ways of holding them. Got a rag, it's alright, but if you haven't got a rag, then fingers like that. Gets a good grip of the eel. Twin fingers like that. You really can grip them. Of course, there's the old trick of lying them on their back. We do that sometimes. They're supposed to stay still. Let's try it. See what happens. No, he don't want to. Anyway, we'll get him in the bucket and get another one. Tackle off again. Right, bait up another rig. Oh, I'll bait this one up, it seems to be okay. Crab seems to be staying on there longer than a rag one. There must be a few crabs busy. One of the things with um, peeler crab is the crabs don't always eat it. This time of the year, the male crabs and the, are looking out for hen crabs to mate. They tend to, not to eat three more hen crabs. So if you use hen crabs, they tend to stay on longer. Now this business is about the bait, leaving it out length of time. If you're fishing with two hooks and you've left it out 10 minutes, a quarter of an hour, um, the bait will be washed out, or you may have a fish on that's got on there without you knowing it. Now sitting there and leaving it out there an hour, you're wasting time. The fish might only come through for an hour, so you want to make the most of that time you've got available. That's why it's handy to have baits and sets ready, and when it gets really hectic, even two or three baited sets for eels, um, some of the matchmen, they tend to have a, an array of baited sets hung from there. The hooks on their rod, that's what these are for. There's a little gadget on this gold one. Two little prongs, you can hang a couple of spare sets there. Well, I haven't bothered today, I'm not in a match situation. I've just used the one spare baited occasionally. But um, when it gets really hectic, I mean 29 eels in an hour, that's going some. 
Well, get that back out again. That rain's not gotten any better. It's still coming down. All right. This time, steady swing, and away we go. Now we're ending up fishing, tending to fish down tide. So I'm letting a bit of line out to get the baits on the bottom. Put a bite on that rod. Sometimes these eels pick the bait up, play with it, and then drop your line slack. Great big bow. You think bass, and it's only an eel. No, I think it's more wind than anything. Just tighten that line up a bit. We don't get line bites in sea angling, like freshwater anglers do. But sometimes you get a, a turn or a seagull come along, even a cormorant hit your line, then you know it. Well, you jump out of your skin, one of them. There's a sooty turbid flying backwards and forwards along here, quite close to the rods, but he's managed to avoid the line. That's another point. Line is dangerous to seabirds and people and dogs and cows and all sorts of things. I picked up a great big watch when I got here. Doesn't rot. Monofilament. I see there's a bit of grease weasel on there, and that's not going to rot. Anyway, we'll put it in the gear, dispose of it later on, put it in the bag with the rest of the rubbish. Don't leave it lying around on the beach, even short lengths. There's a, there is a tip if you've got line, a short length of line. What I tend to do, get a piece, if you've got it just a short length and you want to get rid of it, roll it around your hand and cut it up into short pieces. Now, I'm not saying you throw them all over the beach, I'm saying you put them in your bag and when you chuck, chuck it in the rubbish at home, those short pieces are not going to do any harm if they end up with a rubbish tip. Because a lot of the time, you put stuff in the rubbish bin, you think I'm being a conscientious angler, tidy, you put it in the rubbish bin, it goes to the tip, and the seagulls come along, ravaging the tip, get tangled up. So cut it up into short pieces. Well, that wind's really got up now. I've had to brick up the old rod rest here. It's blown over. I've got a bite too now. Yeah, that looks like a band. I'll give it a bit of time, that. I've only got... Yeah, I think maybe a flounder. Once again, a bit of weed out there. Yeah, there's something on here, something small. Flatty, I think. No, no, it might be an eel. Eel or flatfish is one or the other. Yeah, it's come right to the surface straight away. It's definitely a fish. I've got an eagle on there. It's only a little baby one, but... Here he comes. Now, yeah, I've got to get it up without... Hey, yes. Now, yeah, a little snotty. Just about big enough to eat that one. But we'll let him go, I think. Let him go into one of those two and a half pounders. It's not looked very badly. Just in the middle. Get the uh, slime rag. Send it up the line, it's blowing there. There's a lot of wind. A little bit of the rig. That's where the old QF's coming out of. You get tangles, just unhook the rig and away you go. Rank, where are you? Blown away, I think. Yeah, they really get the hook down them sometimes. You can only just slip up. Sorry, that. No. What we do? Leave the hook in him. I'm going to put him back. I'll put him back, that'll rot down in within a week and he'll be okay. Right, I guess go down there for the water's edge. But failing that, I'll put him in the other side. I don't want to keep 
big one, that small. This is a big one we want, a big granddaddy one. Well, I've got to put another hook on that ring. When you're in a hill match, I'd have a few hooks tied to nylon ready. It's inevitable that sooner or later you're going to get a, a tangle or you're going to lose a hook. I'll just reel this in and rebait it because the, uh, the... Yep, it's not a big fish but it's a... It's an eel, it's a flounder. One of the two. There he's coming. Yeah, it's a flounder. Got a big lump of weed on his nose too. Now I've got to get him over them rocks. Uh, hooked up in the bottom. I'm going to have to go down the bottom. I'm on your step where you got down here. Yeah, I'm on your step down here. That's the trouble with fishing far back on this tide with this tide drop back. Out there at the moment, so I want to make the most of it. Right, here he is. Not a bad, not a bad size flounder. Oh, well yeah, he's about stock size flounder, about 12 ounces. Peter Crab again, of course. Big half. Oh. Look at that dark colour. He's been foraging in amongst the weed in the rack for crabs. Right, we'll take him off. Put him in the bucket to recuperate. Try and get the lid off. Right. Put him back in a minute. Wipe my hands. Oh, it's maybe a puff going down there. I must be out of condition. Now, the only trouble with that is these rocks is to scuff the snoods up. Might be wise to redo a couple of these snoods. This one's not so bad, I'll have to check the other one when I reel in because they're getting damaged. I'll get a needle on that spins up and might, might come away. Right, nice small crab. Get it on there. Right, and a ragworm. Let's pick a nice big one. I like the head part of the ragworm reels. It's a bit tougher, the crabs don't get them off. So we get him right on through the head, thread him right on the hook. Don't need to leave a tail hanging for the eels, but perhaps this time we'll go for a flounder. As soon as there's some out there, we'll make a flounder bait up and show you. Basically, as many ragworm as these small ones as you can get on the hook for flounders. Nice wriggly tail, so stick them right in the head. Just take them in a few inches, push the worm right over the eye of the hook, leave the tail hanging. Again. Right. Put the hands. And away we go again. Up tight a little bit, this into the wind. Short range that one. Right, while we make, wait for the next bite, I'll show you this the other frame I was talking about, the other 6.5 frame. This is a, a 6.5 GR, Abu GR. I've discontinued this reel now, but um, this one piece frame is solid aluminium. In space, it's been painted gold or sprayed gold and I've sprayed it red. Basically the line goes down inside, they've got to be machined so accurately the line can go down inside the spool. So what I've done is sprayed it with a coat of paint, 
it tightens that up, the bow, and stops the line going down. These frames are made by a couple of manufacturers in Kent, you can still get them, uh, so if you've got GRs, and GRs are still available in the tackle shops, even though Avery are not, not making them anymore. They're nice reel, they're magnetic, magnetic brakes, unlike the Ultracast, which is brake blocks. The difference, there's another difference between, can I have another bite then? The difference between the, the two reels is that um, the Ultracast, the latest model, runs the spindle, goes through the spool, and the spool itself revolves on the spindle. This one, the spindle is an integral part of the spool, pops out each end and it actually resolve, revolves the whole thing. This one, they, the feeling is that it will give us a few extra yards casting. Um, probably will, but it will only be noticeable on the tournament field. Wind's a problem, it's certainly blowing. I've had a couple of little tickles on this rod again. I think I think there's a lot of little tiny eels there now. They're pecking the bait. Picking and pecking at. They do this and you've got to scale route right down to about a size four to hook them. Oh there's another little bite. There's something small playing with it. Drop the line slack. It's probably up hooked himself. If it's an eel, they do that. I've got a bit of weed on the line as well, that probably magnified the bite. Yeah, it's only small fish this is. But a great long length of weed hanging on the line. These diver leaders are certainly the trick because that'll go through the leader, leader knot. There we are, look at that, the leader came through it because the, the leader's in 15 pound line, came through it. But with a problem, as soon as it gets near those rocks down there, it's a bit like Gravesend at home. You get a nice cod or something on and he dives to the rocks at the last minute. And you're reluctant to go down, down the bottom because if you go down the bottom, you're likely to trip over. Oh, it's a little bass, I've got it out of the water. I don't want to drag it all over the rocks. So what I'll do, I'll put the rod down and go down there. These bass, down in Hampshire, they call them checkers. We call them schoolies in Kent. He's only about four ounces. Tiny little thing. I'd like to see him go back alive. We've had enough trouble with bass. I'm trying to protect them from gill nets and what have you. Oh, there you go, Alan. Don't hurry. <laughs> right, here he is. Dear little thing. Oh, he's hooked uh, not too bad. There we are. Now that's that one day could grow into a British record if we get him back in the water quick. 19 pounds and it's held by David Bourne and he caught it in my hometown of Dover in Kent. That's the record. Now it takes about 25 years for that fish to reach that size. They're very, very grow, slow growing species. But as you can see, he's a perfect little spiky fins. Now, as a, a tip for anybody who's a bit frightened of bass, they've got a very sharp gill cover and the sharp spiky fin. Now, I'm, I'm used to handling them, so I know exactly where they, they're sharp. But a good idea, if you get a bass, is to hold it by the mouth. Anything like that, little blennies or anything, they're not going to bite you very hard, much less than one of those, which the gill cover well, the spike can draw blood quite easily. You see, that's very, very sharp. Anyway, we'll get him back in the sea and let him swim away. Take him right out. Hold him in the water a bit. There he goes. That's our good deed for the day. Right, we'll get this tackle up, back up the top. Good old QF swivel. Save me looping that line all up and getting it tangled in the rocks. I'll take the trace, go up and then pull the line up afterwards. Keeps your fitness running up and down the rocks. I wouldn't like to fish here at night. I bet this place is full of rats. Right. Well, that's a bass. I would have liked to have caught a bigger one, but... I'm afraid present day conditions, daylight angling makes catching a decent bass very difficult. 
and in Hampshire here in Langston Harbour the place is full of little checkers sometimes you can't fish because they keep getting on the hook and you don't want to kill too many so we're stuck with eels and flounders but a night session perhaps on the in front you might get a, a decent bass but he's, he's definitely the fish that you've got to turn to darkness nowadays to get right we'll put another rig on and get back out while these fish are feeding there just might be a bigger bass out there waiting to be caught well we've not had a bite for a few minutes now fish seems to have gone off and what we have had has been small so I think um, it's time to give it a give it best I've got a bit wet and a bit windy now I've blown about a bit and the weather's closing in even more now uh, before we go I'll um, recap over what we've done during the day now this kind of fishing for flounders and eels a place like Langston Harbour it's not as exciting as fishing for big bass and things or cod in the winter but it keeps you fishing during the summer plenty of action lots of bites and um, quite a quite a bit of fun involved in what you're actually going to catch flounders and eels they're not commercially sought so there are plenty of them about in most of the estuaries and around the coast the flounders probably perhaps the sea's most prolific fish around Britain it's like the blackbird in the country everywhere you go there's a blackbird in the sea everywhere you go there's a flounder right we've had as you can see the layout today I've got my gear pretty tight under the brolly mainly to keep the stuff dry I don't like it getting wet but it does pay to keep your gear together don't leave traces lying around they get tangled around their feet and trip you up and you can forget them and leave one behind on the beach and you know what that can do um, bait wise it's important that's one thing we must must keep on about the bait now fresh bait is better than stale bait obviously but frozen bait is next to useless if you go and collect your own you've got the best go and get your ragworm yourself it's easy to dig you get three a spit around this area um, crabs are the same all, all, they're not available all the year round locally but when the eels and the flounders are in they're in that's what the flounders and the eels are after so collect your own crabs um, perhaps one of the important things about crabs I mentioned previously is that they've got to be in the right state when they use them the right state of peeling that is it's no use getting hold of a peeler crab that you know is a peeler crab ripping the shell off and finding that it is hard underneath what happens the whole internal skeleton of the crab and all its juices that all soft when it's at its prime state just about to shed its shell now when it sheds its shell that's when the fish come in they know exactly what's happening and they come in in droves to feed on those crabs that are shedding so when you've got crabs make sure the ones you're using are just got a little hairline crack at the back of the shell just lifting off ragworms not so, not so fussy um, they'll keep for a week you can keep them in the fridge if, you, if you're not going to use them straight away in a bit of weed or some wet newspaper um, recap on tackle basically the outfit I've used you've seen today is we call it a pattern oster it's hooks on snoods running off a main line very simple there's no need for long elaborate traces okay as a matchman I use boons sometimes and a variation on a trace but most of the time and this applies to a lot of fishing a straight simple pack noster rig is the best it's most efficient it's most aerodynamic for casting it doesn't tangle and that's one of the things um, you make up a rig you make it up on dry land and it doesn't tangle you think perfect but when it gets in the sea it's a different environment and in the sea it might tangle so basically you want, it, want the hooks so that they can't meet each other or tangle around the, around the um, main body of the line. Another thing with the traces is the strength of the line you make the trace. Don't go too light on your snoods. There is a tendency in summer to go to 15 pound line in your snoods. There's no real need for that. In fact, it can be a hindrance because 15 pound tangles much easier than 25 or 26. For eel fishing, I go even as high as 30. Hang on a minute, there's a touch there. Small bite, something small. Something on there. Oh, look at that. Got little eel. Two little eels. Uh, little slimies are coming through now. I think it's time to go home. Oh, they've dropped in behind that rock down the bottom there. I'll have to go down. Little eels, definitely time to grow. They come through on the. A shoal of them have come through, obviously. A 
bit too small to be bothered with. They usually tangle you right up. Look behind the rock there. Uh, one's come up. I thought I saw two. Look at that little tiny thing. Ah, oh, little tiny thing. There we are. We let him go. Oh, he's gone. Right. Well, we've had a good day. Weather's not been too good. I'm a bit wet all over. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. We've had a few fish, we've had a few flounder. One nice flounder, a few eels. It's been a good day. I hope to see you again sometime.